My name is Jennifer Borland. I am the um, director of the Digital Humanities Initiative, and I also teach art history in the Department of Art. The DH initiative began three years ago, um, and since then we've organized a variety of lectures by visiting scholars, um, met for groups uh, to do um, things like uh, book groups and arranged workshops and networked with others across the university. You can find us on Twitter at OKStateDH, uh, and we do have a website in the works, which we will tell you all about as soon as it's ready, but mm -hmm. hopefully by the end of the spring semester. Um, you can also email me, jenniferborland.borland uh, at okstate.edu, if you would like to be added to our email list to hear about future events. Um, we're always excited to have new participants to um, become part of our initiative. Um, but on to today's, to event, uh, today's event. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce today um, Dr. Rupika Rassam. Dr. Rassam is an assistant professor of English and English education and faculty fellow for digital library initiatives at Salem State University in Massachusetts, where she founded and directs the Graduate Certificate in Digital Studies and the Digital Scholars Program, which is an undergraduate digital humanities research program. Her research focuses on building and sustaining humanities knowledge infrastructures in post-colonial African diaspora and US ethnic studies. She is also co-editor of the Digital Black Atlantic for the debates in the Digital Humanities series at the University of Minnesota Press. Her work has also appeared in Digital Scholarship in the Humanities, Digital Humanities Quarterly, First Monday, and Popular Communications, among others. She is also the co-founder of Reanimate, an intersectional feminist publishing collective that recovers archival writing by women in media activism. Her monograph, New Digital Worlds, Postcolonial Digital Humanities in Theory, Praxis, and Pedagogy, was published by Northwestern University Press in 2018. Uh, a handful of us read it in our reading group on Monday, and um, it was extremely inspiring. I think we all left that conversation super excited uh, to hear what she has to tell us today. Um, the book examines how we can remediate inequalities in, digital cultural, in the digital cultural record where dominant cultural values that have shaped print culture are not only reproduced but also amplified. I think the book um, was not only inspiring or is not only inspiring, um, but also speaks to the conceptualization of the digital humanities that we aspire to here at OSU that is expansive and inclusionary in her words, quote, the opportunity to intervene in the digital cultural record, to tell new stories, shed light on counter histories, and create spaces for communities to produce and share their own knowledges, should they wish, is the great promise of digital humanities. She is also a member of the team that created Torn Apart Separados, um, the project that you're going to be hearing about today. Um, last June, are you going to introduce it? So maybe I don't need to describe it. She can tell you more about that. Um, but we're hoping to hear about this and also kind of see how this connects to some of her work that she's already done, but also the work that she's looking to do. Um, and maybe she'll also talk a little bit about sort of how this fits into her future research, which is also extremely exciting and also speaks to the possibilities of transforming humanities knowledge in the, and even changing kind of the very nature and future of um, higher ed itself. So I think that um, so many of the projects and areas of research that she's worked on have um, really wonderful implications for um, all of us who are working in higher ed and thinking about where um, the kind of future of the humanities fits within the future of higher ed. And now, we are so lucky to hear more about this future-oriented humanities work grounded in social justice and committed to change in higher education from Dr. Rassam herself. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rupika Rassam to OSU. So, can everybody hear me? I think this is supposed to be on. Yes? Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, um, Jennifer, for the introduction, and to Mary as well for facilita facilitating my visit. Um, I'm really thrilled to, to be here and to talk to you about some of the work that I've been doing, both in, on Torn Apart and some of my, my other research. As Jennifer's uh, introduction 
signaled really what drives my work is this concern about uh, the practices of digital humanities in which so many are engaged and in particular the ways that unless we are really carefully attending to the way that digital humanities is engaging with marginalized communities and communities of color and, and communities whose stories have not always uh, been told or told by them themselves in print uh, knowledge production then what we're in danger of doing is sort of amplifying uh, a print record um, that's already that's already exclusionary and the trouble with that of course is that as publics as multiple publics are looking uh, to the internet and to the digital public square for sources of information online uh, what they're what they're finding is often a reiteration and then therefore an application of um, the white dominant uh, cultural narratives that that we have um, we have kind of received through our print culture. And so um, that's been a, a, an interest of mine in term, in that my first book, New Digital Worlds, and thinking about you know, how should we think about the practices of digital humanities differently in ways that can address some of these, these concerns. And I often think of that, that work, that first book, as being addressed specifically to practitioners of digital humanities who are you know, actively engaged in research and perhaps um, are looking for ways that they might uh, rethink their practices or the way they design their projects to uh, be uh, to be more conscious of the role they can play in uh, creating equity and justice in the digital cultural record. Um, and then sort of on the flip side, looking towards the work that I'm, I'm doing now on a new book called Insurgent Academics, I'm trying to trace a lineage of what I call academic insurgency, of which Torn Apart and other interventions and mobilized uh, experimental uh, public and digital humanities are engaged, to connect it to a lineage of academic work and an academic tradition that's been uh, van the va vanguarded by, by scholars of color since the late 19th century. Uh, in particular, I look at the way that uh, professors were engaging in protest literature in the late 19th century um, to, to think about kind of what is the value of the university and of the humanities and its responsibility, particularly to communities of color. I then trace that throughout the 20th century, looking at the careers of some really interesting academic, scholar, activists who, uh, like W.B. Du Bois, uh, Audre Lorde, Bell Hooks, and others, whose work uh, embodies a number of characteristics that I see being very connected to the kinds of interventions that mobilized and public humanities scholars are doing now which is they're working in multiple genres, they're collaborating with communities in and outside of the academy and really troubling that, that binary. Um, they're thinking about multiple modes of communication for their work and they're thinking about, um, and about um, different uh, genres of writing as well. And so uh, that's, been, that's been really interesting um, to work on as well because what I'm trying to do in, in this new book is actually I'm going to show people who are interested in getting involved in mobilized and public and digital humanities, particularly scholars of color, that they're actually participating in this very long lineage that wasn't digital per se, but was very much um, a transformative mode of academic scholarship that's been going on um, for, for uh, quite a long time, particularly among scholars of color and sort of helping to use that as a as an inspiration and a justification for doing doing this kind of work, particularly um, particularly because uh, I'll be frank, we're often de-incentivized from doing digital humanities scholarship, public humanities, engaged scholarship, uh, because particularly in the realm of, of tenure line jobs. Uh, we are we're often find ourselves hewing to these expectations of what a tenured uh, tenured um, faculty member or tenured librarian should do um, and those are very disciplinary in many ways and so I'm interested in, in using this work to try and think about how do we break out of that how do we build on some of the really interesting work that's been going on uh, in the Modern Language Association American Historical Association Oral History Association that are, are trying to make the case for different kinds of academic interventions as being you know, as important, as valuable as um, the more typical genres of academic scholarship. 
outcome. So uh, the sort of aside from the connection that you know torn apart is an example of mobilized humanities. So the other uh, one of the areas that I address in, in this new book that I've been working on is actually around the temporality of academic life. So I'm going to use that a little briefly as a little bridge into torn apart separados. Uh, the temporality of which is you know is is slightly mind blowing when I think about it now, um, even though I lived it in June of 2018. Uh, so I don't know how many of you have seen the book The Slow Professor or heard of this book. It came out a couple of years ago, and it was very interesting. Uh, the argument behind it was that you know there's been the slow food movement, other kinds of slow movements. We haven't had a slow professor movement. Um, I was, I'm really bad at this because I read this slow professor book in about an hour. And then I realized, okay, maybe I'm not the target audience here. But it was really interesting about this argument that you know faculty members in positions of privilege really should you know, slow down and be this model of, of slower academic scholarship and a more humane pace of life. Um, which you know, and, and there have been a number of important critiques of this book. One of the main ones is around um, you know, the ability of the, the tenured professor to embrace slow professing is built on the labor of contingent faculty whose pace uh, does not slow um, commensurately. Um, and then a, cri a critique that, that I have of it that I haven't really seen articulated uh, in the responses to it is also that, you know, I don't, as, oh, sorry, the microphone right there. As a scholar of color, if I were to suddenly start slowing down what I'm doing when I already feel the pressure to try and overproduce to overcompensate for my well, both for, for my, my racial and ethnic identity and for my, my gender identity, that um, I'm not sure how well that'll work out for me. Uh, and that doesn't mean that the, this isn't an admirable goal and that we shouldn't really rethink uh, the, the humanity of the kind of expectations around temporality in, in higher ed. Um, but I was thinking about this a lot when we started doing this work on Torn Apart Separados, uh, the first volume of which you can see up here was a project that we uh, created in seven days. To not the usual temporality of digital humanities scholarship, not the usual temporality of, of humanities scholarship uh, in general, of course. Um, so, you know, while there are these calls for slow, D, slow DH too, uh, I've seen Moya Bailey uh, talking about slow DH, and I think there's absolutely important value to this. Uh, what I'm talking about here is what I sometimes like to refer to as DH on speed. Um, because uh, we were really were working uh, at speed, in particular because we were responding to, um, to a, a political crisis, and the crisis demanded a response that was speedy. So, um, Torn Apart Separados is an example of what a number of us have come to term uh, mobilized humanities, and you can hear the sort of implicit speed in the term in the term mobilized. Um, it's a it's a term that has been uh, really um, spearheaded by the Group for Experimental Methods in the Humanities, uh, which was founded at Columbia University by Manan Ahmed, Alex Hill, and Dennis Tennant, um, and they um, have been have been thinking through a number of the ways that digital humanities can respond in times of crisis. Uh, and before Torn Apart, the, the intervention that they, that they had led that, that had really gotten a lot of traction was uh, the Puerto Rico Mapathon. So uh, once Hurricane Maria had the Category 4 hurricane hit Puerto Rico, uh, there was a, an issue around the fact that the maps that were being used by aid workers were out of date because the hurricane had um, taken down bridges and, and blocked roads and so forth. Uh, so what they did was organize, uh, the Group for Experimental Methods organized a mapathon at Columbia University where they taught um, faculty members, staff, students, and members of the community how to update the open street map that the aid workers were using by comparing it to updated satellite imagery that showed what the circumstances on the ground actually looked like, and then to outline and either validate the map as it was or indicate where there was a problem with it. And so they were actually able to, in addition to the 60 participants who uh, were actually at Columbia, they, they kind of ex spread this model to 25 other universities. And so there were a sizable number of people who were, who were mobilized, if you will, to engage um, 
in response to the, to the hurricane. So uh, there's very much that tradition uh, coming out of that group of uh, mobilized humanities uh, interventions. And so uh, when we started hearing some of the uh, issues around, around the US-Mexico border, um, naturally, you know, we, we all sort of were coming back to this question of with our skills in technology and in the humanities, with our research skills, uh, was there anything we could do to intervene? And so the origins of Torn Apart Separados are actually in late May 2018. Uh, if you remember when there was this concern that the U.S. government had lost children, do you remember this? The lost children, 5,000 lost children. So when this happened, Alex Hill and I were talking to each other about whether there was, again, this, this question of, was there something we can do? We can research, we can build maps. Is there a way to respond? And we started, uh, much like the way we would come to start the project that would be Torn Apart Separados, by doing research. And so we spent a day or a night or so digging into uh, the, the process around the management of uh, migrants by the US government. And what we learned actually ahead of the media cycle was that these children actually were legitimately unaccompanied minors. So the problem had been that because the family separation policy, that when families arrived at the borders, the children would be separated from their parents, had been announced, there was this conflation going on between the family separation policy and the actual management of unaccompanied minors who had arrived at the border. So the, the sort of media cycle and the social media outrage cycle were, were starting to, to think, you know, that the, the U.S. government was taking these children from their parents and then losing them, which as we know now actually is what ended up happening, but that actually wasn't what happened at that time. These 5,000 children uh, had arrived at the border unaccompanied. They go into this system that's been devised for management of the children. So they, according to the Flores Settlement of 1996, they can't be held for more than 20 days. And they're supposed to be held in the least restrictive setting based on their needs. So the, the US government has contracted out to a number of nonprofit organizations to, to run these shelters, right, for the children. And so uh, we, what happens then is that within 20 days, they need to find either a relative or a sponsor. And 90% of the children go to relatives. Often, this is critical, relatives who are undocumented. And so then in 30 days, when this office, called the Office of Refugee Resettlement, calls up the relative or sponsor and nobody picks up the phone, the children are now designated as lost. And so, you know, what we discovered in this research, and we we're also reaching out to social workers and activists and people who work on the ground with migrant communities, is that actually many of these people did not want to be found because they were undocumented and they were concerned that if they were found, if they picked up the phone, if they brought the kids to immigration court, then they might be deported. So there was this issue around, around this question of, of children being lost uh, that, we, that we sort of realized, wait a minute, we don't want to find them. This kind of motivation towards finding the children that we were seeing in social media was, was misguided. And so we thought, you know, the best thing we can do with our expertise is share the knowledge that we have found with as many people as possible and not do any kind of project, uh, just share information. So we did that. Um, and so uh, that's really, you know, I think for me, one of the most, instru most instructive lessons of doing this work is that, you know, it's tempting to be techno utopian or techno solutionist and think, you know, just because we can do something, we should. But in fact, no, you really have to be this sort of evaluative process and research to determine a whether or not what you might end up doing would be appropriate for the situation and be what are some of the ethical concerns around doing that. And I'll return to this ethical issue in a minute because it came up again with the actual, the actual Torn Apart project. So a few weeks after this lost children situation, we started to see the news cycle heating up again around family separation. So we're looking now at maybe second week of June all of us, we started seeing the images of the families and the, the children being taken from the parents of videos. It was really horrible. This question came up again 
this time between Alex Hill and Manan Ahmed, uh, who are on this project, you know, was there something we could do? And this time, uh, they reached out to, to some of the rest of us who had expressed interest. And, you know, we again said, okay, wait, let's stop and let's do research and let's think about, you know, what is it that we could possibly do? But let's, let's start with some research on, on, um, on immigration uh, and immigrant detention. And we didn't know what data we would find. We didn't have any plans for what we would do with the data if we found it. We just parked three days to do research and to see what we could find. Uh, and that would ultimately become uh, this series of data visualizations um, that we put together for, uh, in, the, in the week that we worked on the project. And um, briefly, before I describe the process, I just want to acknowledge uh, the colleagues who, who worked on this, uh, our core team for volume one. Uh, I've mentioned Manan Ahmed, there's also Mayra Alvarez, Silvia Fernandez, I mentioned Alex Hill, uh, Marissa Martinez, Mosir de Saperera, uh, Linda Rodriguez, and, and me. And when Linda was working on this project, she actually had end stage terminal cancer. Uh, and this is the last, she's a, who's a digital humanist, this is the last project she worked on. And so, um, you know, we always dedicate our, if we talk about the project, we always dedicate our, our presentation uh, to her because um, she was a huge inspiration to all of us to keep working on it. Um, so we, we, what we did was, is we, that's volume two, we parked uh, our, our three days for research, looking for everything we could find about immigrant detention. And uh, what we found rather quickly, and I'll show you what this visualization show in a second, uh, was we found the data that comprises the, the orange dots on this visualization, which we call clinks. This was you know, what would become the iconic image of Torn Apart um, because it shows, what we were trying to show people is that ICE is everywhere. Um, so the orange dots here are all immigrant detention centers that uh, are contracted to ICE. The large, uh, the large circles correspond to facilities that have, an, uh, have a daily population of migrants. And then the smaller circles, which are also orange, uh, are ones that are contracted to use, so like uh, county jails, for example, who they are contracted with ICE, willing to house uh, detainees, but at the time of this data set, did not have a daily population. And so we found that, uh, that data, from uh, a FOIA request that had previously been filed by the National Immigrant um, Justice Center. So because it was a previously filed FOIA request, the data is from uh, November 2017. Now we were working in June uh, 2018, but we knew because we were working at speed, we weren't gonna get a FOIA request in time. And we were working with FOIA librarians and sort of the um, people who are kind of like professional FOIAers. And so we, we, were, we were trying, um, but we also recognized that we wanted, we wanted to work within the media cycle of this story because our ultimate end goal was try to figure out the names and the addresses of all the children's shelters to and get the word out that we had that data so that social workers, activists, and lawyers would get in touch with us to ask us for the data so they could help out their clients. And that was ultimately our, our end goal. And we, we'd managed to do that actually, so spoiler alert. Um, but what we had in that data set in addition was that we knew the number of children's shelters. And these were the children's shelters that were part of that, that uh, schema for managing children that I described earlier. And so we uh, knew roughly where they were geographically, but, we did, but everything else was redacted. So we knew where they were geographically and how many there were. So we actually went ahead and hand curated the list of the 113 shelters that are contracted uh, to house juveniles, and those are in purple, so you can see some of them down here. Um, and actually, there are some in the, in the Northeast. Uh, there are actually some, can't see right now, but in, um, there's a number in Chicago, California, and then of course along the border, the um, US-Mexico border, as you might, ex uh, you might expect to find. And the way we found that was we knew roughly where they were, we knew the number. We went into usaspending.gov 
to see what organizations that the Office of Refugee Resettlement was giving block grants to. Where were they giving out money? And so we got a num name, a, uh, the names of a number of nonprofit organizations, some of which you probably have heard about in the reporting around the family separation policy, like Southwest Key, for example, is a name a lot of people have heard. Um, Lutheran Family Services is another one. And so we had a sense of where that money was going. Uh, and then we started um, looking through old immigration records of transfers of juveniles from facilities to immigration court. And so we had lists of that from 2015. So we cross-referenced that uh, with the current um, funding data uh, and also uh, we're looking through um, 990 tax documents for the nonprofit organizations. I had really randomly taken a grant workshop the week before where they had taught us how to look into foundations tax records. And so this turned out to be a very useful skill because I knew how to do it. And so we started looking there. We were Googling, we were looking at news reports. And in the end, we managed to come up with our list of 113 children's shelters that we had verified uh, with a minimum of two sources, one of which was a governmental source. Uh, the, the other kinds of sources, a current government source. The other sources were you know, older government sources, journalistic accounts, um, tax documents, Google, and so forth. Uh, and just as a sort of interesting um, sort of side note on that, um, we, we put together an essay called Textures for each volume of the project where we talked to, it's really the critical apparatus for our project, um, where we talk about kind of what we were trying to do, where we failed, what we, where there were some leads we thought we were following and they didn't work out. And then also sort of some interesting things we found that we didn't really have any other place to put. And so um, these were actually pretty instrumental, the reason I'm mentioning them, in, in getting attention for the project, um, which we needed because we were trying to court that media cycle. So the first was, uh, I came across this. This was when I was just Googling the names of shelters, trying to find their addresses. Uh, I found this Google uh, entry for a Southwest Key Shelter in Tucson. And if you can see what it says here, uh, it says, uh, Necesito información sobre mi hija. So I need information about my daughter. And this is like this horrifying moment for me doing this research of thinking about how desperate somebody must be. They're asking this question to this Google directory um, that you know no one's managing this Google Google directory. You know from Southwest Key, it was just this one of these many um, sort of horrifying moments of doing this research. Uh, Alex he had found uh, that while Googling as well that there were families rating detention centers on Facebook. Um, so there were people writing about you know, go, trips to go visiting their family members in detention centers and so forth. Um, and then he actually tweeted about this. Uh, then Slate ended up, somebody from Slate wrote an article about this rate my detention center phenomenon, which actually helped get some of the word of our project out and was sort of the beginning of the way we tried to intentionally um, get into the media cycle. And so, but what we started seeing after the Slate article came out and went viral is actually random members of the public coming back to these detention center Facebook uh, places and protesting the family separation policy in these reviews. So there's this kind of strange um, media ecology that was going on alongside the work that we were, we were doing. Um, but because of, of some of these, uh, the because of the, the attention at some of these kind of horrifying details um, uh, we're, we're getting for us, we were approached by Wired Magazine uh, if, if they could do a fly on the wall story of us while we were working on the project. And we decided that the answer was yes, because fundamentally what we wanted to do was, as I said before, get the word out that we had the data. Um, so, once we had that data, that was after three days, the question was then what we were going to do with it. And as I said before, we didn't know. Uh, we just knew we wanted to, to do something that would be memorable. We wanted to tell stories about immigration. Uh, I should also mention that all of us who worked on the project, we were, e we were either immigrants ourselves or grew up in the borderlands of the US-Mexico border. So this had also a very personal uh, dimension for all of us. Um, 
as well. And so um, we got on Skype. So the three who were in New York were in a classroom in, at Columbia University at a chalkboard. And the rest of us uh, who four in Texas, me in Boston, one in Sweden, were on Skype um, and they were drawing pictures on the board and we were drawing pictures on pieces of paper and holding them up to our camera as we tried to envision what we could do with the data and what kind of stories we could tell. And one of the questions I often get about this project is why is this digital humanities? You know, this isn't a humanities data. And I say sort of several things in response to that. I say, first of all, every single one of us who worked on this project is trained um, in digital humanities and either as a historian or a literary scholar. Um, and this includes our librarians. And uh, every single one of these people is also trained in postcolonial theory. And so we are coming at this project and thinking through what we can and can't do with data deeply informed by, uh, in some of our cases, you know, a decade of experience in digital humanities and a decade uh, of thinking about digital humanities in relationship to social justice, um, but also this kind of very uh, clear uh, theoretical sensibility that comes out of being trained in postcolonial studies. Uh, and the other sense as well is that we were thinking about this as data storytelling and telling stories with data. Um, so while this map that you're looking at is sort of a more typical data visualization, and then even in volume two, we have some more uh, typical data visualizations, we also have some ways that we play around with the genre of data visualization simply to tell a story and do things with the tools that they weren't really designed to do and that are not necessarily expected as an intervention in data visualization, but we're playing around with it to tell stories and playing around with the genre. So one example is uh, this, the second visualization we created, which is called the trap. And so the trap is intended uh, to illuminate some of the tensions and um, even some of the kind of absurdities uh, around the border and around policing of the border. So what you can see here, uh, if you can see this, is along the border, there are these semicircular indentations. And those are the points, those are the ports of entry where, theoretically speaking, asylum seekers have the legal right to go and seek asylum. What was happening at the time um, in, in the summer of 2018, and again, we saw this actually in November 2018 happening again around Thanksgiving in Tijuana, is that the ports of entry were being intentionally closed. And there was a sort of intentional move to prevent or to slow the process of asylum seeking. And so what would happen in that case, you know, the US government had Customs and Border Patrol agents standing in the middle of the, the bridges over the Rio Grande River saying, turn around and turning people away. We also had families um, you know, waiting at the ports of entry on the Mexico side of the border because the US government was only uh, processing three asylum claims a day. And they were, you know, they were creating a crisis, a, a crisis they could police. And so what was happening, but people you know, getting frustrated and, and you know, coming out of desperation uh, was either they crossing these spaces in between the ports of entry. And of course, when you cross there, your crossing is criminalized and it's a misdemeanor. So, you know, it's like you walk, you know, five yards to the east and you legally could uh, claim asylum if, if, if that's, you know, if they're allowing people to, or walk, you know, five yards that way and suddenly you're a criminal. Uh, and then this space here is the hundred miles uh, from the border in which uh, Customs and Border Patrol and, or, and ICE rather are, are able to stop and ask people uh, for their papers and to enforce immigration laws. And so um, we wanted to kind of tell that story. And by the way, even though what we depict here is the southern border, this is that 100 mile radius pertains to all borders. So it pertains to the Canadian border, um, the coasts as well. Um, I mentioned the ethical piece a little bit. So I wanted to show you this visualization because it both demonstrates the ethical, uh, some of the ethical dimensions we struggled with as well as the, um, my point about taking liberties with the genre of data visualization. So one of the questions that came up for us over and over again that I kept harping on 
I think they were getting sick of me, was uh, this question of to what extent should we make this data of where the children are openly available to random people? So on the one hand, we wanted people who were in positions to help migrants. No, we wanted them to know that we had this data and that we share it with them. But at the same time, I had some really serious reservations about just providing an aggregated list of addresses of facilities housing an already vulnerable population of children. And you know, at that point, we had also we were in contact with activists and social workers, and we had uh, you know heard from them their concern, for example, that people were showing up at airports where children were being transited when being. Um, sent to these shelters, and that these are children who are already traumatized because they've been separated from their families um, and, and are, are in the process of migration. They uh, often didn't speak English, so they had no idea what people were saying, and all it felt like was that there were just a bunch of grown-ups yelling at these already traumatized children. And so we were concerned that if we made uh, the locations really easily available, that really well-meaning people without experience organizing or without experience working with migrant children populations would just show up and then potentially you know, re-traumatize the children or invite state violence uh, in a space with our already vulnerable child population. So we decided that we would map the data at the city and state level on the actual data visualization, although everything is a JSON object, a JavaScript uh, object notation object. So you can actually scrape all that data right out of our our project through um, JavaScript, but that's just an extra step that you know most people don't think to do. So we were fine with that. Um, and so this uh, data visualization, and I'll put that in quotation marks, I'll call it a data story, is intended to evoke uh, some of those ethical debates. Uh, it's called ORR to reference the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which uh, contracts these shelters. And when you try and click on one of these uh, dots, it eludes your grasp. So we were trying to both evoke our own sort of ambivalence about providing this information, uh, as well as kind of this, if you want, it's a little cliche, but the slipperiness and shadiness of ice, um, all in this, in this visualization. Um, so uh, that was, uh, so when we released the project, uh, around, I believe it was the 25th of June, 2018, uh, the Wired article came out about two hours after it. She was waiting, Emily, Emily Dreyfus, the, the writer, at Wired, she was waiting for us to launch the project. We launched the project. Two hours later, she launched the article, and so we were able uh, to get the word out. Um, we, were, we shared our data with the Washington Post and their data journalism team, and they were really excited. They said our data was really robust. Um, and they were really happy to have it, and we were happy to share it with them because they agreed with us around this question of protecting the children and their whereabouts and that, you know, we said you happy to have you use the data, but please don't just you know, put a list of these <laughs> addresses online. Um, conversely, we didn't share our data with ProPublica. We were, they wrote to us and they said, we want your data. We want to make everything easily available. And we didn't want that because at that time, you know, everybody, the attention of most people were still focused on this issue. So we were concerned about, about the safety and security of, of children. Um, so what ended up happening then at that point is uh, Alex, Hill, and I were in Mexico City at the Digital Humanities Conference. And so our project was out and people were asking us about it and then people really wanted to help. And so one of the things that we had, one of the things that was motivating us in working on this project was actually we also wanted to show that there are these moments, particularly moments of political and cultural and environmental crisis where you feel so much like there is nothing I can do. Maybe sometimes there is something you can do. And this was this was it for us, right? This was what we felt like we could do. And and you know, for the most part, we we accomplished it. So we then had all these people. We were at a conference with you know 700 digital humanists with all these skills saying, we want to help, we want to help. So what we ended up doing was we held uh, two events at our Airbnb. One was a design sprint where we introduced people to our data and had them envision potential new uses for the data. And then uh, the, the last night of the conference, we held a rapid prototyping event uh, where we had small groups working on several of the ideas that had come out of the design sprint. And that was what, was la what laid the groundwork for volume two, 
of the project. Volume two, uh, which we like to call Follow the Money, uh, so we're spurred to a question that we kept coming back around to, which was that we had seen in these other maps from volume one that there is this, this significant infrastructure in the U.S. of immigrant detention. And the question was, well, where's the money coming from that's funding this? And who's making money off of this? And so one of the, uh, the prototypes that came out of, of the events at the Mexico City Conference was, um, was what would turn into to volume two. We had several others. Uh, the most interesting one, which we talk about in the textures essay with volume two, that we couldn't make happen was we wanted to create a media barometer where you could um, input a term and find out where in local media across the US people were talking about that term. And ultimately, uh, why that failed was the cost of the APIs uh, for the for the um, news outlets was beyond what we had because you know we did this with zero. Uh, we simply did this work by abandoning our lives and abandoning our families and abandoning our jobs and you know pretending we weren't abandoning all of those people and things uh, to try and, and do this project in a week. And so um, we didn't have any money. We just had skills and we had the will. Um, and the stamina to do it. And so volume two, as I may have said, took two months. Uh, on the 4th of July, when we were recovering from the conference, I was on usaspending.gov trying to see if I could find the government contracts for uh, ICE, and I did. And so we ended up with a data set of 20,000 government contracts going back to 2014. And then the question was, how do we uh, visualize that? And so again, you know, we took this, a similar tactic, which was um, drawing things on pieces of paper and holding them up to Skype to each other. Um, and so the sort of first um, visualization to come out of it was the one you're looking at right now, which shows uh, ICE contracts given out by congressional district. Uh, so actually blue refers to Republican districts and, and green to Democratic districts, and it's a chloroplast map. So the more opaque the color is, that's, that shows a higher density of money given out in a particular congressional district. Um, and so what, you know, what you, strikes you about this map is that you know, this is like a bipartisan situation, right? This isn't like, oh, the Republicans have more money. Um, it, is, it is quite bi bipartisan. And you know, I was, when I was looking at this data, you know, I saw, and this was actually not entirely surprising to me, my parents' next door neighbor had a contract with ICE. Because um, I'm from DC. Um, I grew up in DC. and so. There's a lot of money, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, um, around there as well. Uh, so that was our first visualization. This one, I think, is actually the most striking and the most simple. Uh, it's, we call it RAIN, and it shows the increase of uh, government spending over time from fiscal year 2014 um, up through fiscal year 2018. This is a 687% increase in funding. We did the math on that one um, over time to fund um, immigrant detention in the U.S. Uh, we also um, we have a scroll of shame where um, it will actually tell you things we handpicked for our scroll of shame. So universities that have ICE contracts, we were sort of horrified by that. Um, private prison corporations that have ICE contracts, that is actually the biggest Contractors, people making the most money, are actually the private prison people making money off immigrant detention. Uh, we also, you know, one of the quirks of government contracting data that I now know more about than I really ever wanted to because I was the data person on this project uh, is that it, you know, it talks about, um, you know, certain government contracts are earmarked for equal opportunity. And so we created um, a visualization called Equal Opportunity Oppression uh, to um, sort of shame, I suppose the, um, the uh, businesses owned by people of color that were uh, making money off of, of ICE as well. Um, and then we have another, uh, uh, several other visualizations that you, I'm happy to show you during the Q&A or you can look at on your own. Um, but what I wanted to note as well is that you know, this wasn't just about this project. I mean, it was about this project, but we were also interested in thinking through how what we were doing could be a model 
for other people who might want to do this kind of work. And so um, this is the Nibble Tense Toolkit, which um, is edited by Alex Hill. And so it outlines a number of sort of different um, what we call nimble interventions that use digital humanities. And the idea is kind of quick responsiveness uh, in relation to like political crisis or culture crisis, environmental crisis. And so we took our experience, called it rapid response research, and then wrote up our model for how to do it. Everything from thinking through whether or not the crisis needs a response to how do you find your people, how do you determine what skill sets do you need to put together to effectively do a project, um, how do you handle you know, project management, how do you court the media, and things like that, um, as well as you can see a note on the hidden cost of this work, which is that affective or emotional um, labor component that, that we kept running into, into as well. So what we were set out to do, and what I think we managed to do in the project, is to, to show how a team of researchers comprised of faculty, librarians, and graduate students, even a group is distributed across you know, multiple continents and multiple states, uh, can pool their skills together um, and respond in a time of crisis, and then to hopefully uh, share, share with others how, how to do that. 